Hey, Tegan, what's in the bag? It's the show where I come home from the comic book store and we look through my bag because uh, I, I buy way too many comic books. Uh, if you like this show, if you like any of my shows, I'd like to point you in the direction of uh, my Patreon. That's how you can support me and support, well, whatever the, we're calling this here. All right, let's get going. Let's just pull the Band-Aid right off. I, I feel on some profound level partially responsible for this. I, I know in, in very real terms I'm not at all responsible uh, for the creation of this comic book. But at the same time, I, I spent months uh, haranguing the comics industry over the fact that no one was publishing duck comics in the United States. Dynamite? Dynamite has a whole shelf of Disney books. Fantagraphics? They don't necessarily put out a lot of monthly comic books anymore, but they put out a lot of Disney books. But the company that was first to the post here was Marvel with uh, Jason Aaron. Now, when this was first announced, I know a lot of people really didn't like that Aaron's name was attached to it, especially since you know they, he made a big deal out of going to DC recently. So it seemed kind of odd for the company from that perspective. And, you know, I've read Jason Aaron comics that I liked. I've read Jason Aaron comics that, that were perfectly fine. He's not the first person I, I would have picked for Scrooge. He's not, he's not on that list. First of all, I mean, the first person, if you're going to go for mainstream comics, the first person uh, in line is, is Larry Hammock because he's been talking about it for decades in every interview. People ask, well, what do you want to do? And he says, I, I, same thing I've always wanted to do. R write Uncle Scrooge. And he's been, he's been saying that as long as he's been giving interviews. Uh, and you go back and look, uh, what are his famous, like his personal famous creations? Well, one of them is Bucky O'Hare with Michael Golden. So uh, that's, you know, he walks the walk and doesn't just talk the talk when it comes to funny animals. You know, so, all right. Setting aside Hama, I don't know, the first person I would have probably called was Mark Wade. Of course, Mark Wade's doing a lot of DC right now. I don't know if he's exclusive. I don't pay attention to that stuff. But then somewhere down that line, once you get past, like, I don't know, Duggan, uh, Al Ewing, they got to Jason Aaron. Now, I don't know if this is an un unlimited series or limited series. It looks actually, now that I'm flipping through it, kind of like a one shot. Uh, oh, man, they really went out of their way with variant covers here. I, of course, you know, pick the, the Alex Ross cover, even though Alex Ross's ducks look kind of strange. They, they just do. I, I really like Alex Ross. From, from back in the day, and I think he's, he's really evolved into a terrific artist in the 21st century, but it's just something about drawing those, those ducks with, with that Alex Ross style. Of course, you know, there are lots of these variants, and not all of them were good. Some of them were interesting. There was a Frank Miller that, that actually was kind of kind of cool. Never seen Frank Miller draw a, a Disney duck before. Uh, J. Scott Campbell did one. Uh, Steve McNiven, Peach Momoko, Pepe Larraz, John Romita Jr., Ron Lim. The Ron Lim one was kind of cool. Scotty Young. Scotty Young was pretty obvious. In fact, if Scotty Young doesn't draw more ducks at some point, I'd be surprised. Walter Simonson one was cool as well. Uh, this has four different art teams on it. I, I think it might be something that was, was this published in another, I guess I'd find out if I actually read it, if it was published in another market first and then compiled for the American market. But in any event, this is Marvel's, you know, big, big push that they're going to be doing the ducks now. And right on the back of the book, they're advertising the, the next one, which is what if Donald Duck became 
Wolverine, which looks like it's uh, not going to be any of the Marvel uh, guys or, or gals. It's the um, uh, Italian talent, which is, you know, these days, if you see a new Duck comic, it will probably have European names on it because Europeans care a lot more about the ducks than Americans do. That is just like straight up. What are you doing? And they even uh, reprinted Christmas at Bear Mountain here in the back. If you already don't have like three copies of Christmas on Bear Mountain off the top of my head, I think I have it in a in a Gladstone book and in the, one of the Fantagraphics hardcovers. So that's at least two copies I had of Christmas in Bear Mountain prior to this. But you could probably guess, uh, talking to me, that I'm I'm a person who has multiple copies of many Carl Burke stories. Oh, that's a nice. Swing into the origin and original adventures of Spider-Gwen the Ghost Spider. It's a nice cover there. So, yeah, what really got the headlines when this was announced was that Uncle Scrooge is doing a multiverse story. Which, you know, I guess it makes sense. It's not something that really upsets me that much because all the pieces are there. There are tons of different versions of the character. They can, you know, do time. They've already done plenty of time travel in Donald Duck comic books. Oh, man. Pet Avengers. I was really upset. Someone straight up asked uh, Brevor years ago, and, and they said that the, the Pet Avengers books weren't in continuity, but I don't believe them. I don't believe them. I think they're lying about that. They don't want us to know the secret. Oh, Scrooge above all. So, okay. All right. You got an evil Scrooge going between universes and getting all the number one dimes. Well, I, there are worse ideas if you're going to do this type of uh, multiverse. Oh, and I see they're, they're going to the all bin. My goodness. It, it, admittedly, this, this is kind of fun, just, just flipping through it. This is pretty pretty basic uh, stuff to, you know, expand this uh, mythos here. Oh, but this isn't, th th we know all these characters. These are all the different Scrooge, the different ages of Scrooge straight out of Don Rosa's um, Life and Times. Young Scrooge, uh, Cowboy Scrooge, uh, the Scrooge who rode a lion through uh, the Transvaal, the Yukon Scrooge, uh, well, that looks like a future Scrooge with a ray gun. And the Scrooge in the, the, the armor who fought the duel at his parents' castle. I literally, we, we just read um, Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck, you know, a few months ago on the channel. One of the, one of the best duck stories of all time. Probably the best duck story not written by Carl Barks. Uh... Now, this is, I don't know if this book is going to end up in any kids' hands. I don't know if this book is going to be sold to children uh, who are going to be, you know, your market for Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, which is which is a great book, highly recommended. I've read it, like, at least the first year of it, I think. It had uh, Amy Reader uh, doing the writing for it. Love this character, love this book, and it ended up lasting a while. Uh, but I don't know. It, it seems like they're really putting a best foot forward to try and make a package that is friendly to kids. But are kids even the, the Scrooge demographic anymore? I mean, even the, they did that DuckTales reboot, but that's a few years in the past now, too. All right, so yeah, this looks fun. I'm, I'm sure I'll sit down and, and reread it and enjoy it. It looks like it's filled with stuff for, for people like me who, who can tell you where each different <laughs> Uncle Scrooge came from. Uh, all right, and here's the, the Carl Barks reprint, which eh, doesn't look so bad as far as these reprints go. Obviously, it's, you know, they're reprinting it, shrinking it down from the Golden Age size, and that's why you have the, the margins. A few, like a couple months ago, uh, I we actually looked at an issue, an actual issue of Dell 4 Color with uh, a Carl Barks 10-pager on the Tech Talk, and you can see the original Golden Age size of the Dell books. They, they don't have any you know, big white bars on the bottom. The books are just sort of um, squatter. There's there's more art on the page, so this is always shrunk down. <sighs> All right, but we've all read Christmas on Bear Mountain, first appearance of Scrooge, 
first uh, first real contact that Scrooge had with his family after, uh, you know, basically a after what we see in, in Rosa, which is Scrooge alienating his family, and that's why uh, Scrooge is someone who they don't know at the outset of that story. What are you doing? Now, admittedly, you know, um, Rosa took a few liberties, which he, he admitted. He admitted he took a few liberties with the, uh, the dramaturgy of Christmas at Bear Mountain to make his uh, chapter 12 work, but, you know. Next, for more Marvel and Disney fun, check out these upcoming titles. What if Donald Duck became Wolverine? And what if Donald Duck became Thor? <sighs> I hate that they're making these because, uh, you know, am I going to see Donald Duck as Wolverine? I'm, I'm, I'm going to read Donald Duck as Wolverine if, if they insist. This Power Pack series was great. We're going to be doing... Uh, this was a recent five-issue limited series. We're, we're going to be doing this on the channel at some point because it's got June Brigman, five issues. She has not dropped a step. Louise Simonson writing, so it's the original creative team back again. All right. One good turn deserves another. We looked at the Uncle Scrooge comic with an Alex Ross cover. So let's look at the Immortal Thor with an Alex Ross cover. Now, uh, every day that there's a new issue of Immortal Thor, I, I get to go on social media and see all the people complaining that they don't get it, or it's not clicking for them, or it's not as good as Immortal Hulk. To which I say, this is everything I've ever wanted from a Thor comic book. I'm not exaggerating for comedic effect. Ewing is creating an entire run of Thor out of uh, the backup feature for 1989's uh, annual crossover Atlantis Attacks. If you go back, get out your copy of the Silver Surfer Annual Number 2. Read the, uh, the first chapter of the Saga of the Serpent Crown, and you will get a nice little potted history in like five or six pages of the God War at the dawn of time where Gaia, who is Thor's mother, goes to war with Set and uh, Chthon and all the other uh, elder gods for the future of Earth, and Gaia wins, and that's why there is life on the planet Earth to begin with and not simply, you know, constant, unceasing God war. And that is one of the origin stories of the Marvel Universe that doesn't necessarily get explored. Anyway, the first time you read that, you realize, oh, wait a minute, this, this right here, this is the beating heart of, you know, all mythology in, in the history of the Marvel Universe. And of course, you know, no one ever really does anything with it because no one has traditionally ever done anything with Gaia set is very rarely used. Uh, you know, Cthon, he, he gets the occasional workout because he's, he's got a connection to other characters. But uh, straight up, the immortal Thor is Ewing going right, right for the jugular there, right for, you know, what I thought when I was eight years old, which is that, oh yes, like the God War at the dawn of time, like that is the wellspring of everything else that comes later. And this run is basically about that in, in total. What we have over the course of the first 12 or so issues is essentially Gaia returning uh, to restart, to rekindle the God War, more or less, because she's not happy with Homo sapien. And that right there, that is a great, great hook. And anyone who doesn't see it, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I'll be I'll be out here enjoying this this Thor comic. Uh, so yeah, what's happening? I don't know. Another thing I like about this run is he's going out of his way, Ewing, to try and reincorporate the the character with his his more with his mythic past, not just lip service. But we're actually getting quotes here from the Eddas. Now, if you've never read the Eddas. Um, there, there's both prose and poetry edits. I read them in, in college. If you have not read them and you have any 
affection or interest at all in Thor and, and Norse mythology, mythology in general. I definitely recommend them. They're some of the uh, the source material of, of Western civilization, and that they're all we have really for the Norse gods. We have so many prose sources for the Greek gods and the Roman gods, but very little survived in prose uh, of the Norse, just the Eddas. And they were written down generations later by uh, Christian scribes. So, you know, there's kind of funky uh, transcription already just in the version we have, but they're, you know, one of the most, one of our most precious uh, literary heritages on this, on this planet. If you have not read them, you should go read them. They're not thick books. They're, they're, they're kind of thin. You could read them in a couple of afternoons and really, you know. Man, I'm seeing lots of ads. I'm, I'm excited. What was I just saying the other day? You put the rock band ad at the front of the magazine. You put the Coca-Cola ad at the front of the magazine. Now, if you're a creator, I'm sorry. You're, you're sitting there going, oh, I don't want the ads, you know, getting in the way of the flow of the story. And it's like, well, would you rather the company have money to publish your magazine or would you rather have a good flow in the first couple of pages? Because, you know, those two aren't always the same goal there. I'm glad to see Angela showing up. They, they sort of stapled her onto the Thor mythos a few years, you know, a few years, like well over 10 years at this point. Oh, man. I'm sorry. You know, I was on board with, with Venom when Hitch was on board. But as soon as they brought in, like, Black Widow... And Al Ewing was only writing the title like half the time. Like, I, I'm sorry, I'm not that into Venom. And like all this weird drama with his kid. And they still have Flash. They didn't stop Flash from being the anti-Venom, agent anti-Venom, I guess. And I think this is Normie Osborn, I want to say. Uh, man, that's one of those things that's going on in the Spider-Man books that I'm just, you know... <sighs> So, yeah, Tear. Oh, Tear's dead. Okay. So I'm sure it'll make sense. He's, he's working with magic, the idea of magic and the, uh, the Norse pantheon, which is kind of an interesting, um, kind of an interesting little cul-de-sac in Marvel because you, you think, oh, Norse gods, they're just, you know, made of magic. Well, yeah, but are they made of magic or are they secretly like strange space aliens like Earth X would, would have us believe. And if you go back and actually read, you know, the stories, you get interesting conflicting answers, just like, you know, the, the myths themselves. So Ewing's playing with all of that, really, I think, it's in satisfying ways so far. Uh, See now, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. They're doing bullpen bulletins, but it's an artist spotlight for the the Juan for Gary fellow who's doing doing the new Ultimates book. Now, where's the the checklist? And you need to have a little cartoon where one of your editors looks like they should be in prison. You know that? I guess I'm old fashioned. All right, so I don't know what's happening here. We're gonna figure it out later when I sit down and I, I'm actually keeping up. I don't have a pile of these waiting to keep up on. I think I'm uh, only like one issue behind of this because I am really, really enjoying this. And speaking of enjoying this uh, Deadpool Wolverine World War III series, Joe Kelly, Adam Kubert, anything Adam Kubert does now, hey, I'm, I don't know if I'm surprised necessarily, but the dude, when he, when he, does new comics, he really goes all out, worth checking out, at least flipping through. And, you know, anytime Joe Kelly, anytime Joe Kelly writes Deadpool, uh, that's just, you know, I guess you know I'm of a certain demographic because I will get out of bed for Joe Kelly writing Deadpool any day of the week. And NYX, and I think I've already said that that's a real sick fit. They got uh, Laura and... Although, man, she just, they're trying, man. I don't, does she fit? No, I think because they already did such a good job of making her fit in her own milieu, sticking her on the X-Men just, uh, 
it feels like they're they're just trying. They're just going out of their way to try something that people aren't going to accept ultimately in the long run. At the end of all songs, who do they get to pencil this one? Valentina Pintio. He's doing the art, so that's pencils and ink, so it's probably digital. Uh, Espen Grindadiern. Uh, I don't know if, I hope I got that right. Grindadiern, color artist. VC's sees Joe Sapino, letterer. All right. Oh, three pages of letters. You love to see it. You know, people, uh, people obviously are reading the book. Uh, oh, and we got the next annual. Wait a minute. They just had another Thor annual. And every annual is numbered one. Always. I'm sorry. This should be numbered like 40-something. Just straight up. Don't insult our intelligence. I know that there have been many Thor annuals published before this. And Hercules is showing up. And it, everyone loves Hercules. Hercules never goes away. Hercules is always doing something or other. Oh. 2 LP collectible vinyl soundtrack coming soon. All right, how are we doing left here? Well, let's do one more. Well, let's just go for the Triple Crown here. Uh, I buy Doctor Strange primarily because it's got these really nice uh, Alex Ross covers. Um, as for what's going on in Doctor Strange, you know, it usually does, doesn't take uh, that long to flip through. Uh, Jed McKay's Doctor Strange. They just had a fun two-parter with uh, uh, Black Cat guest starring. That was cool. Uh, Pas uh, Pascal Ferry, he's been doing it uh, for the last few issues, and he he's a good artist. He is he is worth uh, flipping through if you run across his name. Heather Moore, color artist. But I don't know what's going on in this blood hunt thing. I'm not reading the main book. Uh... Blade's gone crazy and is telling all the vampires to kill everyone. Something like that, I think. My understanding is uh, that the actual main crossover itself is uh, more well-received, maybe, than people were expecting. But, you know, it's got a thousand crossovers that no one's going to pay any attention to. Uh... So we're looking at what's going on while, wow. oh, Doctor Strange has been turned into a vampire. So is this Wong? Does Wong have a, a shield uniform now? I guess if I you know, read it closer, I could figure that out. I swore to protect the Sorcerer Supreme, and I've been doing a poor job of it. Yeah, really. And they speak of the devil himself. You know, I, I feel bad for Marvel with Blade because they have never, ever been able to make Blade work. They just haven't. And that's not my opinion. That is, that is objectively speaking, looking at the sales history of, objectively, one of their most popular characters in terms of, you know, pop culture saturation, Certainly, the first two of those Blade movies were extraordinarily popular. People still watch them. People still talk about them. And yet, somehow, for decades, they have completely failed to figure out any kind of solo hook that would keep this guy on the shelves by himself for longer than a year. It's just a fact of the matter. And I don't necessarily know after all this time if it's a problem that, that is surmountable whether or not he is a supporting character who just got lucky by you know finding a movie star uh, and a good script one. If you go back to the original Tomb of Dracula, which I highly recommend because it's one of the best comic books Marvel has ever published, Blade's in it, Blade's great. He is a supporting character. He is one of the uh, you know cast of vampire hunters who are 
trying to kill Dracula, and he's even on the outskirts of the group because he's kind of got antisocial tendencies and tends to get, you know go too far and all that good stuff, all the stuff that we associate with Blade. Uh, but on his own, like, you know, he wasn't that bad in the Avengers either. But on his own, uh, people struggle. People who love the character struggle to figure out what to do with him. Uh, so, yeah, what's going on here? I don't know. Agent of Wand. Oh, that's what it was. That's what it was. Oh, wait. Oh, so this is Victor. Well, I could have told you that. Uh, in the early... That, that would have been volume three of Doctor Strange. The, the Roy Thomas run with the Butch Geis art. They did a five-issue story that was essentially just bringing back the vampires after the last volume of Doctor Strange. It had killed them all. and It was prim largely about his brother, uh, Stephen Strange's brother, who was also uh, a vampire, uh, kind of an unlucky sap. Uh, nice looking book. Maybe colored a bit dark. I can see, you know, the because of the, the subject matter, because of the crossover, you'd, you'd want to go dark. But at the same time, you look at that and think, well... This really needs to pop more, because as it is, the only thing that really pops in this is the, the orange sash and glove, and then the white highlights, highlights on, on Wong's uniform there. And that really, you can figure out that they could have they made it pop more. They just could have. Oh, there's, there's Baron Mordo. And I love the dog. I love the dog. That's great. Dog is great. All right, and it's, you know, these Alex Ross covers, they just don't get any less than stellar. See, I learned the lesson the hard way that it's okay to buy a comic book if it has a really nice cover because you will regret it otherwise. I wish I'd bought Wonder Woman for all those years when Adam Hughes did the covers, and I just wasn't that interested in Wonder Woman. But now you go back, and those those comic books are worth a lot of money because of those Adam Hughes covers. <sighs> you live, you learn, you figure out what what the value of a dollar is. <laughs> all right, well, three Marvel books. All right. If you like this, if, if you like this, uh, uh, if you enjoy the Stations of the Cross with me fighting with my cat, check out the other uh, videos on this channel. I look at old comics on uh, What's in Tegan's Storage Locker, new comics on this show. I got new comic book reviews up every day on TikTok and Instagram. This summer, we're looking at the Lara Hama edited Savage Tales all summer long every Wednesday. That's really fun. That, that's extraordinarily fun. We're just finishing up a run through of Earth X right now. We've got one, one issue left in that. Quite fun, quite fun. What else? Uh, check out my podcast with uh, Claire Napier. It's called Utter Madness. We talk about Top Cow Comics. We will be doing a special show uh, around the time of the release of the, the new Witchblade number one. Don't worry. We're, we're not going to leave you hanging as far as that's concerned. Uh, what else? Eh, I get stuff up at the journal periodically. Uh, I don't know. Just have a great day. Take care of yourself.